I'm Laura Scott. I'm with Healthy Ages, which is part of Cadillac Medical Center. And um, we've been doing these programs now for many, many years. I know that some of you are frequent flyers and come to our programs every month, and some of you are new this time. So I'm glad that you were able to come today and listen to what Barbara has to say. It's very important. Um, things have changed a little bit. She'll explain it to you. And I'm just going to turn it over to Barbara Woodhouse. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, my name is Barbara Woodhouse. I am a registered nurse at Cadillac Medical Center. I am a certified radiology nurse. Um, and I navigate for patients in our diagnostic imaging department. Um, I'm here to talk today with you about a screening test that you may or may not know about. Uh, we all know about mammography and colon screening, skin cancer screening. Well, there, there's a screening exam for ruling out lung cancer that um, involves a low-dose CT scan to evaluate for lung tumors. This screening is for a specific population of people and is now covered by Medicare and many other insurance providers. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about this. If you qualify, you should definitely talk with your physician. So first, I need to give you some facts about lung cancer. Um, so as you can see, lung cancer is the, the green one. So prostate, breast cancer, and lung cancer are the three most diagnosed cancers in the United States. Um, 224,000 people will be diagnosed or were diagnosed with lung cancer in 2014. So lung cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer worldwide. Um, 1.8 million new cases and 1.6 million deaths in 2012. It is the leading cancer killer of people in the United States. Um, in 1987, it surpassed breast cancer to become the leading cancer cause of death in women. Why is that? Mammography. Women, women are having screening mammography now they can catch cancers earlier when they are smaller and easier to treat and most likely curable. Lung cancer causes more deaths than the next three common cancers combined and account for 27% of all cancer deaths. Um, these are very sobering statistics. Why, why is this? A uh, majority of lung cancers are diagnosed late stage, so stage four, because most of the time that's when symptoms occur. That's when patients start having chest pain or rib pain, um, a cough that doesn't go away. They may cough up blood. They may start losing weight. Those kinds of things don't usually happen until very late stage, and then we're behind the game trying to find and treat like, lung cancer. Um, only 15% of cancers are caught in stage one or stage two where they can be more, much more easily treated. There's a lot more treatment options available to people with lung cancer. Um, right now, six out of every 10 people that are diagnosed with lung cancer will die within a year. If we have screening and we can catch people early in earlier stages when tumors are smaller and not spread, um, eight out of 10 will have a longevity of five years or longer. So this late stage, they mean it's dismal. If we can catch it early, then treatment options are much more readily available. So how is the screening done? We do a low dose CAT scan. How many people in here have had a CAT scan before? CT scan, it's pretty common, pretty common. Um, we use images, you know, we take images and slices when we do a CAT scan. So here's a normal chest x-ray. Um, sometimes small tumors are really difficult to see on a chest x-ray. Your radiologists, they can catch them down to one to two centimeters. A CT scan, we can see them at four millimeters. So much, much smaller. So if you see this CT scan here, this patient does have some sort of lung nodule that needs to be followed up. Much easier to see in that CT than it is in the x-ray. And the, the exam is really quick, it's painless. You lay on the CT table. When we're scanning your chest, your arms are above your head. So you'll be laying down with your arms above your head. They do um, two quick scout images. So you're in and out of the scanner once, 
in and out of the scanner twice. That helps the CT tech set up that picture. And then zzzz, your scan is done. It's very, very quick. We don't need to use any contrast for this. You patients that have kidney issues or have allergy to contrast, you don't need to worry because we're not going to give you any. We're not going to start an IV or anything like that. It's a very quick study. It takes about 10 minutes on average. So what does low dose mean? Um, radiation dose can be described in milligrays or millisieverts. And one describes the amount of radiation that's given out by the scanner. The other one describes the amount of radiation that's absorbed by the patient. Um, everybody, no matter where you are, everybody gets background radiation every year. Um, it's in the air, it's in the ground, it's in the food we eat. We are all exposed to radiation every day. Um, somebody that lives in Denver at a higher altitude, they're going to be exposed to more background radiation than somebody at sea level. If you fly cross country for your job back and forth, you're being exposed to more radiation than somebody that doesn't fly all the time. Uh, medical imaging exposes patients to more radiation, obviously, through the year. Um, the exposures may be higher or lower depending on um, if you're having just a simple chest x-ray or if you're having an angiogram, you know, if we're looking at your heart and possibly placing a stent, you're going to have more of a radiation exposure than you would just for that simple chest x-ray or mammogram. Um, our facility now has the capability to track how much radiation you're receiving over time. So if you have an x-ray, a uh, CAT scan, maybe you come in and have a heart cath, through our electronic charting system, through EPIC, we're going to be able to track your total cumulative radiation dose. Um, the normal chest CT, just a regular diagnostic chest CT, will expose you to 10 to 15 millisievert of radiation. Um, with our low dose scan, you're only exposed to 2 to 3 millisievert, which is about the equality of a background, a year's worth of background radiation. It's very low dose. Um, in comparison, like having a head CT that exposes you to about 2 millisievert, a chest x-ray is very small. It's 0.1 millisievert. Um, normal mammogram is about 0.4. Um, the 3D tomos that we use now, it's about 2. So why not just a chest x-ray? Um, the National Lung Screening Trial was a huge um, countrywide trial looking at what's better, a chest x-ray or having a CT scan done. They enrolled almost 53,000 people in this trial and were split into two groups. So one group gets serial chest x-ray every year for three years. The other group gets serial CT scans every year for three years. Uh, researchers found that there was a 15 to 20 percent lower death rate in patients that were having the CTs because we were catching their tumors earlier. Uh, like I said, the helical CT is able to detect, detect those tumors that are very, very small as opposed to having a chest x-ray. The trial was actually stopped two years early in 2010. An independent data and safety monitoring group contacted the director of the study and said, you have the data here that tells us that CT is better than chest x-ray. Let's get this out to the general population. You don't need to continue your trial. Um, <clears throat> within the trial, like I said, there was a 20% reduction in lung cancer deaths. So a screening lung CT can decrease the death rate by 20%. In comparison, mammography, screening mammography, can decrease that death rate by 15%. So we know there's definitely a benefit for this lung screening. That's why it was so important for us to bring it to Cadillac. <clears throat> so who should be screened? Um, Cadillac uses, there's several different societies that have their own screening criteria. Um, many of them, are, they're almost the same in all of them. We're using the National Comprehensive Cancer Network's screening criteria. So a person with the age of 55 to 74 years um, with a 30 or more pack year history of smoking and is a current smoker or has quit within the last 15 years. So that's the main criteria. So what is a pack year? A pack year is somebody who's smoked one pack of cigarettes 
every year. So if you smoked two packs a day for 15 years, you still have that 30 pack year history. If you smoked half a pack a day for 40 years, that's only a 20 pack year history. So it's gonna be important to determine with your doctor what exactly that pack year history is. So if you don't fit that criteria, there's a second set of criteria that's age 50 or older with a 20 pack year history of smoking and also an additional risk factor which means an occupational exposure to um, asbestos, silica, beryllium, chromium, diesel fumes, those kind of things, occupational exposure. Um, if you're diagnosed with COPD or emphysema, if you have a prior history of cancer, any cancer, or if you have a family history of lung cancer, those things put you in group two. Now with all screening, you cannot have any current symptoms of cancer. If you have symptoms, you definitely need to talk to your doctor. It's no longer a screening. It becomes a diagnostic study. So it's a little bit different. Does anybody have any questions about pack year history, about these criteria? We follow this very, very closely. This, this is definitely the, the group that they found the most benefit for this lung screening. Yes? A pack, of, you know, single pack of cigarettes. 20, yeah. So if you smoked a pack a day for 30 years, you know, you, can, you could have stopped and quit and stopped and quit, but that cumulative average gives you your pack year history. That would be one pack year smoking, yes. One pack a day for one year. So if you smoke two packs a day for one year, you have a two pack year history. If you smoke three packs a day, you're really doing this. Over the years. Yeah. So if you smoke three packs a day for 10 years, there's your 30 pack year history. Right there. Yeah. What was a half a pack? Half a pack a day. If you smoked half a pack a day for, you you'd have to smoke half a pack a day for 60 years. That would be a 30 pack year history. So half a pack a day. You kind of divide it in half. So have a pack a day for 15 years, that's only a seven year pack history. Yeah, yep. How do I get screened? So this starts with a conversation with you and your doctor. Medicare says that you need to have a shared decision making with your physician. And you know, Medicare uh, requires now like yearly physical exams where you go and you talk with your doctor about your health and your living situation and all those things and it's kind of a comprehensive look well, this is something that during that time you could talk with your doctor about as well. Um, they need to provide a written order say, stating <coughs> excuse me, that you, um, you have gone over all the screening criteria and that you meet those criteria, that you and your physician have discussed the risks and benefits of the screening, which I'm going to talk with you a little bit about as well, that, he's in, that your physician has informed you of the importance to adhering to, to yearly screening, so we don't want to have you start and then, yeah, I don't really need it, I'm going to drop off. If you're going to do this, you, we want you to continue to do it because it gives, it gives you that benefit, but it also is going to help other people in the long run. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, you're willing and healthy enough to undergo treatment if a cancer is found. And your physician should also discuss the importance of smoking cessation and or Continue, continuing to not smoke if you're currently not smoking. So when they write that order, they're going to confirm that, they, that you've met that criteria, that um, you've gone over all the, the pros and cons of doing it, and that you both together have agreed that, yes, this is the best thing to do. Shared decision making. Is it covered? So yes, as of February 3rd of this year, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, and most other insurance plans will cover this scan for patients that fit that criteria, for that specific criteria. Um, and you know, when Medicare comes up with a ruling, most other private insurance companies follow suit. We have yet to find anybody that is not covered that meet that criteria. Um, we will offer screening for those who meet the criteria but don't have insurance or not um, 
or in, their insurance won't pay. Um, the cost of the CT and the reading fee will be about $300, so that's an option as well. But again, you must meet that criteria to be con considered a screening exam. So this is something that if you talk with your doctor about screening, they're gonna go over is the risk-benefit ratio. Um, the greatest benefit has been studied that it's that high-risk population, those people that are current or former smokers that have smoked for a long time between the ages and are between the ages of 55 and 75. Those are the people that benefit the risk of the radiation dose benefit far outweighs risk. And those are the people that we want to get in for screening. Um, still, there are risks. There's, um, you know, you're going to have anxiety about doing this. And what are they going to find? Are they going to find anything? If we do find something, then there's that risk as well. Um, <clears throat> there can be false positives, which means that we see something, we don't know what it is, we don't know if it's a cancer or not, but we want you to have more testing. That might mean that you have a regular CT scan with contrast. It might mean that you have a PET scan, and the PET scan is the one that um, we use for cancer detection where we inject a radioactive tracer that's tagged to a sugar molecule. Cancer cells take up sugar molecules faster than normal cells do. So that tracer is going to go right to the cancer cells so we can see where they are in the body. And they can tell if a lung tumor is a cancerous tumor or not. Um, it may mean that you have a biopsy. And, you know, um, either a pulmonologist can go down with a scope and take a sample of, a, of an area via that way, or we can do in CT scan, we can do a needle biopsy. So those things can happen. Um, in the trial, 40% of people were having serial CT scans. So over the three years that the person was enrolled, 40% of those people saw an abnormality. They went and did further testing. 95% of those abnormalities were not cancer. So I mean, that's a good thing. But just off the screening CT, we can't tell for sure what it is. We just know that something's there. So there are risks. Risk versus benefit. Anything, anytime you have a medical procedure, it's risk versus benefit. All right, so I was screened. What happens next? Um, when they, when um, American Cancer Society, American College of Radiology and Medicare got together and said, what do we do now? If you, they said, we need to set up specific criteria for people that are going to do this lung screening scan. So for those of you facilities that want to do this, you need to have a CT scanner that is capable of doing this low CT scanning, creating quality images. You know, we can we could do a low dose scan, but the pictures are terrible. Our facility, we can do a low dose scan with the pictures turned out pretty nice. Um, the CT equipment needs to be monitored by a quality assurance company every year. You have to have board certified radiologists to read these exams that have experience with reading these CTs, which we do now. So all of those things come into play. Also, they want to make sure that um, all the patients that come in through CT screening are enrolled in a national registry. We do this for our PET scans as well because it's created a lot of information for the whole country to be able to use to find out um, which tumors are best seen by PET is a national registry. Well, now there's a national registry for people that are, um, that are going through this lung screening. So it contains demographic information. It will contain information about the scan itself. It will contain information about what's seen. If there's a lung tumor seen there, it will contain information about what's done about that tumor. If they have a biopsy or further follow-up, if a tumor is found that's cancerous, we have to document what type of cancer, um, if there's node involvement. So there's a lot of information. There's like 17 to 20 different points of information that we have to record for every patient that comes through for screening. This is gonna be in a national database so we can continue to collect information. It may change the criteria in the next 10 to 15 years. Maybe we'll you know, broaden the criteria because we found that more people can benefit. That's part of knowledge gaining and knowledge sharing. The radiologist, when he reads your exam, um, will 
um, assign a lung RADS criteria. Um, women, if you've had mammogram, you've seen, and you've seen your mammography reports, there's, it's called BIRADS. So they assign a number to your mammogram. It says, you know, your BIRADS 1, you don't need any additional testing. Uh, BIRADS 2, maybe there's something found that needs additional imaging. So there's different steps up to BIRADS 5, which is, yes, this is a cancer. We need to do something about it. So the radiologist will use a grading system called lung RADS, very similar. And you could have, you know, say, continue your screening. You'll have another one in 12 months. May say, well, there might be something there, but it's very small. I want you back in six months for another scan. Um, or there is definitely something that needs to be treated. Let's have you follow up. So they'll categorize that. And then at that point, you're entered in our database and you're entered in a national database. And every year, six months or whatever, you'll get friendly calls from me saying, hi, it's time to schedule your scan again. So I might be talking with you. What if something is found? Um, that report will go to your physician. You and your physician both will be notified of those results. So you will get a result letter. Women having mammography, you know, you get a result letter. You get a, a letter from us saying your screening was fine. We'll see you back in six months or to a year. Same thing's going to happen with this lung screening. You will get reminder letters. You will get a report in the mail. If there's something that needs to be done, that recommendation will be in that letter. So your primary care physician will say, this patient needs to be referred to pulmonology or to oncology if there's something else that needs to be done. Um, if for lung nodules that we found that um, are eight millimeters or larger, so that's something that might be concerning, your case will be discussed at a multidisciplinary team meeting. It's called a tumor board. And this is the radiologist, an oncologist, um, sometimes a radiation oncologist, cardiothoracic surgery, pulmonology, uh, pathology. We get everybody, we get all those doctors together in a room and say, this person, this is their scan. What do we need to do and what's the best course of action? So they all talk together and come up with a plan for the best course of treatment for this patient. So if, you, if we find a lung nodule, this will happen. This takes place over at the cancer center. They do it once a month. If they're smaller than eight millimeters, more than likely they're going to follow you in six months to a year. It really just depends on what, what it looks like. So what can I do to prevent lung cancer? Don't smoke. That's the biggest, most important thing that you can do. Um, here's a sobering thing. At age 65, 8.9% .9 of current male smokers will die of lung cancer in the next 10 years. That's awful versus 0.4% for non-smokers. For women, it's 5.5% of women who smoke will be dead within the next 10 years versus 0.5%. Don't smoke. Um, smoking causes, you know, we all know, smoking causes lots of trouble. It causes peripheral vascular disease. It can cause heart disease. It can cause emphysema, lung cancer, all these different things. So if you do smoke, please talk with your doctor about quitting. The, you know, the sooner you quit, the more healthy it is for you and people around you. Um, there's a lot of different options now to help you quit. Your doctor can help you talk with those. 1-800-QUIT-NOW um, is the Washington State National Quit Line. If you call them, they're going to get your information, your insurance information, and they're going to provide options for you for quitting as well. And that's a free service. You can take advantage of that as well. If you have quit or if you've never smoked, keep up the good work best thing you can do for yourself. So I just wanted to go briefly over some of the other screenings that are available at Cadillac. I mean, most women know we do mammography. We have the um, 3D tomosynthesis now, which is kind of like almost like a CAT scan through the breast for mammography. So we can see pictures and slices as well and we catch small tumors. Um, genetic counseling for patients that may be diagnosed with cancer and want to get some more information about is this, um, can this happened in my family. Um, the high risk breast screening program for people that are at high risk for breast cancer, um, you know, big family histories. They have genetic dis disposition to cancer. Um, those women are entered in our program and they're tracked and followed very closely. 
making sure that they have or <clears throat> mammograms. Sometimes they have MRIs every year. And then we continue to follow if they're diagnosed. And then skin cancer screening. I don't know if you're all aware of that. Our um, plastic surgery dermatology clinic does um, skin cancer screening as well. And that, talk with your provider about that. They can send you a referral. So I just wanted to give you some internet resources um, about lung cancer and about the screening program. Um, I, my cards are on the back there, so if you have questions, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to stay and chat with you as well, but if you have questions after you go home, you feel free to give me a call or an email. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. And if you are part of that age group, or if you know somebody who is, you know, your brothers, your sisters, even children, please have them talk with their doctor about the screening. It, we've found that it, it does save lives. If you catch it at an early stage, you're going to save someone's life. So thank you for having me. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Sure, the question is if you've never smoked but have had a history of cancer, do you qualify for the screening? At this point, no, because you haven't smoked. It's patients that have had a 20-pack year history, so a smaller history of, of smoking. They have smoked in the past and have that cancer diagnosis. Those are the people that are eligible for screening. Um, if you've had breast cancer, you should be followed by either oncologist or by your primary care physician for routine screening. Yep. Did you have a question? So the question is, if, if you've had pneumonia several times, can that be a precursor to developing cancer? As far as, far as I know in front of what I've read, no. That, that is not a risk factor for developing lung cancer. Yes? Sure. So what if, what if you were growing up and parents were smokers and you were exposed to that? Um, again, that secondhand smoke thing is they're at this point not considering that to be part of the high risk category. But I know we were, we were all exposed because that's, I mean, that was the time our parents smoked. Yes. So the question is about pipe and cigar smoking as well. Yes, absolutely. If you smoked a pipe or cigars heavily, for that long of time, I would definitely talk with your doctor. No. It, with with those I mean, with that history, I would definitely talk with your doctor. You may qualify for the screening. Yeah. So the question is: Is it your doctor that makes that determination? It's you and your doctor together make that determination. Yes, once the doctor writes the order for you, after you've had that conversation, once he writes the order, you are part of the screening program if, you, if that's what you choose to do. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my goodness, yeah. Um, so the question is, if, they were, if somebody has never been a smoker but they had high occupational exposure to burning and fumes and things, right now at this point, no. There's not a screening at this point. Part of this registry, you know, we're going to get a lot of information about a lot of patients, and we may find that in, you know, 10 to 15 years from now, we may find that, yes, that is, puts you in a high-risk category, and you know, they may screen for that, but right now, no. It takes, unfortunately, a long time for this information to be gathered and for anybody to say yes. You know, the um, USPTF, the Preventi uh, Health Preventative Task Force, it took from 2002, when they started that lung screening trial, it took until 2010 to say, yeah, maybe it is, maybe it will benefit you. Let's go ahead. So, you know, we've, we've known for a long time that this is a good thing, but it's taken this long to say for insurance to follow suit. Okay, Medicare just started in February. Yes. I had mine done at the cancer place. Mm -hmm. That's where my doctor recommended mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it, and it was $50. I have to pay $50. Yes. Yep. So I should stay with that. According to what I understand with you, this is with the hospital when you join that program. Right. Where I'm with the cancer center. And the cancer center, because yes. Because I started there, Medicare yes. did not cover it. Right. The cancer center has that screening program too. And now, if you're part of that criteria, Medicare will cover your next screening. Oh, they will? Yes. Oh, good. They oh, will good. cover your next good. screening because you fit that criteria. Yeah. Yeah, no, stay with them because they have your priors. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. important. You want to stay where... And everything's okay. Excellent. Yeah. Good news, good news. Yeah. You're having a higher dose. Right. Your question is if um, 
the higher dose of normal CT scan will catch those small masses too. Is that what I'm, is that correct? Yes, it will. Um, you know, higher dose, we're going to get better pictures. It's going to be more clarity, but the higher dose of radiation. For a normal chest CT, the normal dose is about 10 to 15 millisievert. Mm -hmm. Will that hurt you, that uh, CT scans that aren't on the body? We don't know. Over time, you know, over time we've learned that there is a risk of cancer with radiation. People that, you know, people that were exposed in Hiroshima and people that are exposed to Chernobyl, those kind of things, from them, from those huge doses of radiation, we know that there's some damage. Our medical radiation, we don't know. And we know that there is a risk, we just don't know what it is. That's why everybody's so cautious. Yeah. Yes, any other questions I can answer for you? All right, I'm, I'm here if you want to come up and chat. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Take care. Have a good afternoon.